Maybe we'll start in with, um, with a prayer from the Mass, which is from St. Matthew chapter 11. Um, it's one of my favorite passages. So Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We ask you, Father, to send the Spirit into our hearts so that we may learn from your Son, who is meek and lowly of heart, and take his yoke upon us, which is the yoke of the gospel. And we ask for Mary's intercession. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so I love that gospel. And it's interesting. Jesus makes a reference to his yoke. Take my yoke upon you. And so Jewish readers will have a better insight into this because of the, um, the comparison of the yoke with the Torah. And so the Torah is very often spoken of as a kind of yoke. And so Jesus is speaking of his Torah, that is the gospel. Right, and he's saying it's um, light and easy to carry, right? Um, and it gives us rest. Okay, so the um, the topic for today is revolution. Let me just share for a minute the um, the schedule that I've made up. Um, David will put it up on the website. Um, but for the moment. Um, can you see that? My uh, so today um, the ninth um, divine revelation, and then um, I think I'll do the next class on um, faith. So two classes on faith, which is our response to God's revelation, and then um, scripture. So um, sacred scripture, um, its inspiration, its truth, the canon of the, of the Bible, principles of interpretation. And then look at tradition. And I'm not sure. Where, um, so this is all from the kind of the introduction in the catechism before it starts the creed. So the first part of the catechism goes through the creed, the Nicene Creed. But before it does it, it speaks about um, revelation, faith, tradition, um, and scripture. And um, we may skip to the end and do a section on prayer. I haven't decided yet. Right? But anyway, David will put that up on his website so let me stop sharing that so the catechism is divided into four parts the creed the sacraments the christian life which is basically christian morality moral teaching and the fourth part is on prayer and so yeah my goal um is to go through that and to just as we go to highlight those things maybe of special interest for a um inquirers coming from a Jewish perspective, but, um, or just simply to point out the Jewish roots. The catechism does a good job of it. It's really well done in that regard, but we can highlight it more. Okay, can you see my, so this, following the catechism, the first thing that the catechism does after its brief introduction that we looked at last time and the existence of God is to speak about God's revealing himself to us. Oh, by the way, at any moment, if you want to um, ask a question, um, you don't have to wait till the end. You can just um, raise your hand and I should be able to see that. It's, it's on the um, bottom, Larry. Yeah, it's there's a on thing the... on the bottom where you can say raise hand. And if, if I don't see it, um, you can actually just unmute yourself. I don't know, can you? I, I think yes. you can all unmute yourselves and yes. then just speak. 
Okay. All right. So um, divine revelation and um, so last time we briefly talked about how we can know that there is a God from reason, right? And so there we can say there are two ways of knowing about God by reason and by faith. Right? Of the two ways, faith is far superior. Right? And that's simply because reason only gets us so far in knowing that there's a God. Yes, reason can know certain things about God, that he is, that he's good, that he's truth, that he's all powerful. Um, but um, most people or many people don't ever get there. And I was one of those people that didn't get there. So I grew up an atheist till I was 29. And, um, and so we, even though these things can be known, they would only be known by few people after much time and with the mixture of many errors, right? And so God reveals himself um, so that we can know him with certainty and we can know him in a much more intimate way than reason can tell us. Because reason basically only tells us about God as our creator, but we wouldn't know about um, his inner life and his love for us and many of other things, his plan of salvation, um, who he really is, um, in his inner life, which is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, and his plan. And so, um, so God reveals himself. And so there are two different directions. Reason is an upward direction, right? Man seeking God. Revelation is the opposite direction. It's God seeking us. And thanks be to God, he seeks us first. So before we ever seek him, he's already been seeking us from the very beginning. And throughout our lives, he seeks us and calls us. And the catechism does a good job of bringing that out, that God is always calling us, but often we're deaf, right? And we don't hear him um, calling us. And he calls us through first in two ways. Um, each person he calls personally through the desires of our own heart, right? And so there's an, a completely individual way by which he calls us. But then there's also a social public way by which he seeks us. And that's the topic of our talk today. That we call that revelation. God revealing himself, not just heart to heart, but to the whole world, right? And he reveals two kinds of things, right? So some of the things he reveals are things that reason could know, but might miss. And that is that there is a God, right? That he's one that he's all powerful, that he's good, et cetera. The things that we talked about a minute ago that reason can know, but often doesn't. And included in that is even the moral law. And so the 10 commandments in some way can be known because they're written on the heart. But God reveals those things, even though reason could know them so that we can know them with greater certainty and, and, and authority. But then there's a whole other set of things that God reveals that we could never know. And this is his inner life. And we call these mysteries. And that's the principal thing that, and so God's revelation principally is about the mysteries. And we call them mysteries because they're hidden from us. And so reason can never get to them. But even once God reveals them, all right, we know now that God is a Trinity because he's revealed it. And we'll talk more about that in a later session about a month from now, but um, but even after he's revealed it, it's still mysterious. It's not as if the fact that he reveals it makes, ah, yeah, plain, right? It's obvious. Um, no, it's, it's still always shrouded in a darkness because it's above us, right? And so that, that's what we mean by mystery and the, the inner life of God, and he's just infinitely above us. And so theology seeks to explore the mysteries Right? And that's so beautiful, but we have to remember um, the, so today's gospel is really important there, right? Where Jesus said, um, he thanks the father for revealing these things to the little ones. So with regard to divine revelation, we're always gonna, we always want to be those little ones who receive it as something above us, right? Infinitely above us. And as a treasure that we don't have dominion over, but we can receive. 
right? And the two most important mysteries are the Trinity, that's God's inner life. Who is he in his inner life? He's a communion. And again, we'll have a whole class on that. But that in itself is so beautiful that God is not a solitary, but he's a communion of persons. And that means there's an inner life of love between the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit is that love between the Father and the Son. And so God doesn't need to create a world and human beings so as not to be lonely. He's not lonely because he's a communion of persons. Anyway, we'll have a whole session on that. Um, and then the other great mystery is that that God wants to enter into intimate relationship with us, into covenant. And so he made that covenant first with Israel. But the culmination of the covenant is becoming man, becoming a human being so as to be with us in a way proper to human beings, a man with other human, a human being with other human beings. And so that's the, the great mystery of the incarnation, right? And so the creed centers on the Trinity and the incarnation. And then if we wanted to add it, the mystery that to redeem us, the best way that he chose was the most opposite to our expectation, being crucified. And so read the redemption. Okay. All right. So let So the catechism in this section starts out talking about the difficulty. Um, the difficulty. So why does God reveal us? I'm sorry. Why does God reveal himself to us? And we could say for two reasons. To reveal the things that we could grasp, but we would probably get it wrong. And then the second reason is to reveal the mysteries that we would never grasp. And so the catechism points out that um, the human mind obviously had difficulty thinking about the things of God because we tend to put him on our level and that we can't put him on our level because his level is not just a billion times higher than us or a trillion or a quadrillion, but infinitely higher, right? And we can't even think that, right? I might think, all right, I'm higher, we're higher than worms, but is God, God compared to us is infinitely more higher than we are to worms or uh, whatever you want to put in there. Um, and so the fact that he wants to speak to us and reveal himself to us makes sense because we would never come to know him otherwise. But it also should amaze us right? that he wants to uh, reveal himself to us. And the, the reason why we tend to get things wrong is we tend to imagine God as we are. And that, I mean, you see this in pagan religions, right? Think of the Greek myths or any other, um, you know, the, the religions of the nations. Tend to, the tendency is always to imagine the gods to be like kind of magnified human beings. Yeah. And obviously the real God, yes, he becomes man, but he's a man not exactly like, yeah. he's the perfect man. So the catechism is on, this is why we and needs to stand in need of being enlightened by God's revelation. About those things that exceed our understanding. Yes, the mysteries. But even about those things which are not beyond the grasp of human reason. He reveals them too. And so we'll see when we go through the catechism and, and scripture, there'll be a mixture. Certain things reason could know and other things reason could never know. Right? But he wants both of those things to be known by all with firm certainty and with no admixture of error. Right? And that's why he reveals himself. Right? So we can know the, and this is so awesome. St. Thomas Aquinas has an interesting line in one of his works. He's, it's a, he gave a series of talks like what I'm doing here, but um, on the creed. And they were um, lectures that he gave to the people of Naples. In shortly before his death. And they're marvelous, by the way. There's a good way to start reading Thomas Aquinas, his um, sermons on the creed. And at the beginning of it, he compares, um, he says, any, sorry, this is um, maybe sexist, but he says, any old woman who knows the catechism, but of course we could just simply say any human being who knows the catechism and is maybe otherwise completely ignorant, actually knows far more than any Greek philosopher. 
right? Anyone who knows the catechism is wiser than Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, and any other name you wanna add there. Because we know from God's revelation, truths that are the highest that philosophy can ever know, there is a God, um, that he tr transcends, that he's omnipotent, that he's all good, et cetera. And then things that philosophy could never ever know, what we were made for, right? We're made for sharing God's own happiness for eternity. Right? And really, if you don't understand why I exist, that's um, missing out on what's most important in life. Right? And what's, again, what's so beautiful at Revelation is that it's given to everyone without distinction. And Thomas Aquinas, yes, he knows more nuances about God's revelation. But in terms of the essentials, he knows the same as every other member of the faithful. Right? Because the creed is open to everyone. Okay, so we said two kinds of truths. Natural truths, that is those things that reason could know, but usually doesn't. Right? And that would be God's existence, the natural law, more responsibility, the immortality of the soul. So reason Aristotle and Plato give arguments that the human soul is immortal. But nevertheless, those are philosophical arguments. And if you're just on the realm of philosophy, you could say, ah, maybe he got it wrong. And so God reveals the immortality of the soul so that we can know it with certainty from the beginning of our lives. Right? And we teach it to our children from the beginning of that so that they can know that they're not simply meant for you know, 70, 80 years here, but for eternal life. And, and then there are the revealed truths, the mysteries, Trinity incarnation. What, I'm just going to throw this up. What, what would be some of the other mysteries? Anybody want to just unmute yourself and I think of the mysteries of the Rosary? Would those count? Okay, so that would be under the incarnation. So all the mysteries of the life of Christ. So his whole life is a kind of mystery. Right? So the fact that God becomes man and is born in a particular place, Bethlehem, right, in Israel, from Jewish, right, from a Jewish mother, Mary, right? So all of that's mysterious, that we could never know that God would want to do that, right? Because that's his free will, that's his free choice, right? And there's no way we could, um, and then even after it's revealed, we can always contemplate, wow, God who is bigger than the whole universe like the whole universe can't contain him. He wanted to be born in a place, in a little place, a village, Bethlehem, and in a manger, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so life of Christ is all a mystery. What would be in other mysteries? Sorry, this doesn't work so well in Zoom, but just. Do you... Okay, Andrew. Uh, could we say the uh, Mary's assumption, just because sure. we so were the, relying on tradition? That, but even before that, that God wants to have a mother, right? So that Mary's the mother of God. That's super mysterious. Um, and so we're gonna have a class on Mary um, that he chose, right, a Jewish woman, Miriam, right, to be his mother, he's the only one who could choose his mother. We can't do that, but um, but he got to choose her. And then it makes sense. He could also preserve her from being eaten by worms. And so that would be her assumption. And that would make sense. He's a, an observer of the commandment to honor father and mother. Yeah. But we can, Israel itself is a mystery. I'm sorry, William. Or really? part of the interruption, this might be a bit of an arcane point, but now that we're talking more, I, I recall hearing or reading that sometimes Catholicism has runs into difficulties in sub-Saharan Africa where, where polygamy is normative. Ah. And apparently polygamy, and I may be getting this wrong, is consistent with the natural law, but is monogamy, monogamous marriage, uh -huh. is this a revealed truth or is it knowable? Wow, well, great question. Human reason, Fantastic know? question. So I would say that's actually um, among the natural truths that that's not what marriage was meant to be. 
So yes, it's a reveal. There's no doubt it's a revealed truth. And it's we can see it in Genesis chapter two, right? Verse 24, that it's Adam and Eve are monogamous, right? So the original marriage, the model or archetype is monogamous. And then Jesus, when he's asked, and he goes back to the beginning, right? And he points to Genesis 2 as the model of human marriage. So it's a revealed truth. But it's also, I think, something that reason can see. If you take in mind that marriage is not just for um, uh, procreation, but also has a unitive purpose. So the, both the unitive and the procreative purpose are form a unity. And you can't have a fully unitive um, total self-gift um, with many. Right? And so the the men, the fact that so I would put that in a natural truth that's a good example of the fact that we need help with the natural truths about God. And the same thing would be for the indissolubility of marriage. Right? That too is a natural truth. And it comes from the same idea that if marriage by its very nature is to be a total self-gift, if it's total, it can't be, it has to be exclusive, monogamous. And if it's total, it can't be something I retract. But again, we see most of human history missing both of those aspects of marriage, just as poly, um, um, polytheism is also against natural reason, right? Natural reason can see the unity of God, just as it can see the unity even of marriage. Um, but most cultures got it wrong, right? And that shows the fittingness, why we need God's revelation, even for the natural truths. Great. With regard to this, Mr. So I would put that as part of the natural law, but again, a part that most cultures are going to get wrong without the help of revelation. Um, yeah, great question. And yes, that is an obstacle for evangelization, right? Because that's not negotiable. And in this country, of course, there was the case of the Mormons who had right. to discontinue yeah. that practice. Right. And so we get, I'm going to speak later. That's yes. a, obviously that goes against and the credibility of both Islam and Mormonism, the fact that they permit something that natural law actually um, doesn't, even though many cultures don't fail to see that. Um, but anyway, we'll maybe come back to that much later in this course. Thank you. Um, for, so for just a few more mysteries, um, unless anybody wants to about the Eucharist. Okay. Yeah. So all of the sacraments. So the the Eucharist that God wants. So again, it's it presupposes the incarnation. But we'll have several classes. So my plan is to have three classes on the Eucharist in um, I think just after Christmas. Um, and we'll say yes, the Eucharist is a stupendous mystery in which Jesus wants to give himself to us whole and entire and in which he makes the sacrifice of Calvary present for us to join in mystically in every mass. Yes, that's totally mysterious, right? <laughs> so mysterious that tragically many Catholics don't believe it or even many don't even fully know it. They've never been told it. But anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that. Yeah, great question. So I would say the Eucharist and together seven sacraments. In other words, that God wants to give us grace. So even before the sacraments, grace is a mystery. We use the word so frequently, but it's totally mysterious. What gra grace means, sharing in God's own life. And that's going to be the heart of this class. How do we share divine life? But that, again, is should amaze us that that's even shareable, right? In other words, a worm, can a worm share human life? No. Can even, you know, a, a monkey share human life? No. Can we share angelic life? No. But God has revealed that we can share his intimate life and in a progressive way. And that's what we call holiness and the journey or path to holiness. And have, that's what heaven is, is sharing God's life. But he wants that sharing to begin here. So the fact that we can share his life is utterly mysterious. I don't know what I'm talking about when I say this, right? I, I can use the word grace, but I have to recognize that this is way beyond my ability to, um, to reason to or to even think to myself. And so the sacraments are all mysterious because all the sacraments 
are ordered to giving us a share of God's own life in seven different ways. So we'll talk about that about Christmas time. Great. And then that happens in the church. So the church is mysterious. We tend to miss the mystery. We tend to think the church is some institution. And it's true, it is an institution. But just as Israel was a kind of institution um, formed by God with his own law, with certain structures given by God, but the whole, so Israel, likewise, I don't mean the state today, but I mean the people Israel from Abraham on adopted by God brought into a covenant, that's mysterious. So we could say the covenants are mysteries, right? Because reason would never get to it that God would wanna make a covenant with human beings, right? Because that, again, that's putting, it seems like that would be putting himself on our level. And that's exactly what he wants to do is to, well, he brings himself down to our level so as to raise us up mysteriously to his, right? So the covenants with Israel and the church are mysterious. And then both the life of Israel, the people Israel, um, and the church are mysteries. Great. Okay. Um, there's lots more mysteries, but um, we could say the last things, heaven, hell, and purgatory are mysterious. Right? But above all, heaven, that God wants to bring us to share his life for eternity. So we'll have a whole session on what we call the last things. Right in the catechism has a beautiful section on that. Okay. And so God reveals mysteries which are above us. How can we understand them? And the fact is God brings them down to our level by using analogies. And those analogies are from creation. And so scripture is constantly speaking about God and his plan um, using things from our life and our world. And we can do that because he's made us. And so creatures bear some resemblance to God. Um, the, now that he's infinitely above us. And so we bear infinitely more dis, disresemblance. Or, but, but both things are true. In other words, we fall short of resembling him and it's especially through sin. But even... Um, a sinful person, that which is all every single one of us, um, still always ref reflects him, and not just human beings, but everything he can't, he, everything that he makes reflects him in some way. Think of the mountaintops, the ocean, the galaxies, um, everything reflects his glory, and so he can speak about himself using analogy, and so everything that we do in in theology and in the catechism is going to make use of analogy speaking about God with analogy. And so you always have to remember that analogies limp, right? They're helpful, we need them, but they always fall short. And so we have to um, remember that they're analogies. And that's simply because God transcends all creatures. So the, maybe the best image is father, right? So God speaks about himself as a father, but obviously my human father falls short of representing God the father. But we need that, right? He, he's revealed himself as father for a reason. And that is that human fatherhood really does speak about who he is, even though um, he infinitely transcends any created fatherhood. And that's actually, it gives great dignity to human realities, right? To think, so I'm a dad. And so that's, that's awesome, right? To think that I'm sharing something with God the Father. I'm also a son. I'm sharing something with God the Son. And we're called to be bonds of unity. And in that sense, we share something with God the Holy Spirit, who is the bond of union and the divine person who is proceeds as love. But we always have to remember that when we speak about God, right, there's a there's a, a real analogy, but between the creator and the creature. No similitude can be expressed without implying an even greater dissimilitude. That is, God always remains infinitely higher than any analogy. Right? The analogy is true. He really is father, right? But he's father in a higher way. He really is son, God the son, right? But he's son in a better, higher way than I'm son of my father. He really is love, but again, love in a higher way than we're able to love. 
And, and what that means is we can't rightly grasp who he is, right? We grasp him by analogy, but we grasp better what he isn't. He's not limited, right? So when you think about it, all the words that we use to describe God generally imply some kind of negation, right? Like infinite. He's not finite. I can't know that infinity directly. What we know is what's finite. And so we're just negating it and applying it to God. And so all of what we say about God has a certain um, negative aspect, right? He's, yes, he's really his father, but he's not a father in the way of human fathers. He's not in time. So when we say he's eternal, what we really mean is he's not measured by time as we are. So let's now start in with Revelation. So God reveals himself to man. And so this is a beautiful way that the Catechism begins this part. It's, it's quoting the Second Vatican Council. And so this document called De Verbo means the word of God. It's a beautiful document on divine revelation from Vatican II, from 1965. And it starts by with this idea. It pleased God in his goodness and wisdom to reveal himself and to make known the mystery of his will. Right? To reveal himself. to and to make known basically his inner life, his free decision about wanting to enter into relationship with us. His will was that all men should have access to the Father through Christ, the Word made flesh, the Son. That is, his will is that we become sons of the Father in Yeshua, Jesus, his only Son. And that's through the Spirit. The spirit is the divine person that makes us, that molds us. He's like the sculptor. I used to do sculpture um, 30 years ago. And so I love sculpture analogies. Um, and so the Holy Spirit is the divine sculptor. He's the divine person that sculpts our soul to make us in the image. And he's got only one model. And that's the son who's the perfect image of the father. Right? And so the Holy Spirit sculpts us to make us like the son to put us in relation with the Father. And that's the purpose of everything. So to have access to the Father through Christ, the word made flesh in the Holy Spirit and thus become sharers in the divine nature. We said just a minute ago, that's the definition of grace, sanctifying grace, right? St. Paul is always talking about grace. And that's ultimately what he means, sharing in God's own life and in God's love, right? And we can't do that by ourselves. In other words, that's why we call it grace. Grace is gratuitous, something that comes to us from above that I can't pull down by myself or pull myself up to, right? It's something that we need to receive from him. Yeah, so that's a fantastic quotation. And so and then the next paragraph, God who dwells in unapproachable light wants to communicate his own divine life to the men he freely created, right? So again, he's made us, we're his creatures. He's our creator, we're his creatures. But God's not satisfied with that. He wants to make us sons and daughters. And he makes us his sons in his only begotten son. And so, so Jesus is the, the natural son, and we become sons um, in him. And that's true of every human being, right? So um, there's no other way to the father. This is why Jesus says, right? There's no other way to the father than through me, right? Because he's the one and only natural son. And God reveals himself. By revealing himself, God wishes to make them, human beings, capable of responding to him and that is capable of speaking back right so he speaks to us first and he his whole purpose is to bring us into right and that's isn't that exactly what we mean by a covenant he reveals himself so that we can respond to him in a covenant and to know him and that's progressive right so to know him more in our own lifetime and in the lifetime of of mankind as well so to make us, so that was, again, our gospel for today spoke about that, that Jesus 
is the only one who knows the father. Right? This, only the son knows the father and those to whom the son reveals him. So he, Jesus, who knows the father, reveals the father so we can know him too. And that makes us capable of loving him far beyond our natural, our own natural capacity. Yes, we have a, just simply by nature, we have a certain power to love, right? So every human being naturally loves their parents, at least unless they're unnatural and, um, and those who do good to us, et cetera. And it's natural that we might you know, love God, the creator, because he made us. But God wants us to love him in a different way, not simply as our creator, but as our father. And that's beyond our natural power. And if he doesn't give us that power to love him in that kind of a way, we can't do it. Right? And so, and notice the order here, knowing him and loving him. There's a, an order. You can't, there, philosophers like this have a saying, you can't know, you can't love what you don't know. And so this is why God reveals himself through words so that we can come to know him. But knowing isn't the, the ultimate, right? We want to come to know him so that we can love him. That's the goal. Right? And that's, that's the great commandment, right? To love God with all our, that's the Shema Yisrael, right? To love him with all our, our heart, mind, and soul, all our strength. All right, so everything, we, so let me just dwell on that for a minute. So that's the purpose of this whole course, and of all catechesis is so that we can come to know God better. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and to love him beyond our own strength through the Holy Spirit's power. Right? That's why we were made. That's the purpose of this course. Oh, I went backwards. So the divine plan of revelation is realized simultaneously by deeds and by words. Notice the order there. Interesting. I would have been, if I were writing this, I might have put words first, but that would be a mistake. So God reveals himself in two ways by speaking to us, and that's words like I'm trying to do right now using this Zoom. And, but God reveals himself better by deeds, right? And when we think about human beings, it's the same, right? Think of parents with regard to their children. Parents reveal themselves through words, right? telling maybe the kids what to do, but they reveal themselves much more by deeds, loving their children, taking care of them. And it's the same with God, right? He reveals himself by speaking to us. And that's what we call revelation. But even more importantly, far more importantly, by doing things. First of all, creating us, right? Creating us out of nothing. But then once he's created us, calling us into relationship, right? So the covenant is both a deed and words, right? So God, God gave words to Moses at Mount Sinai, but more importantly, were the deeds of bringing Israel out of Egypt, right? So the deeds spoke far louder than the words and the deeds gave force to the words. So that's what the catechism is saying here. And then the same thing is true of Jesus. Right? Jesus taught lots of things, Sermon on the Mount. But more importantly, he revealed himself by deeds. And those deeds were, above all, his death, right? Being crucified and rising from the dead, right? That, and then another deed was founding his church, instituting the Eucharist, right? All of these involve words, but most of all is, and, and it, again, spouses, Right? We can show our love for one another with words, but if the words aren't backed up by greater deeds, the words fall short. So these deeds and words are intrinsically bound up with each other. So again, an, an important consequence of this is that, so we speak about salvation history. Right? It's one of the terms that theologians use all the time, but that's really interesting. God's revelation isn't um, you know, a kind of um, fancy philosophy about God. It's above all an historical record of God's interaction with humanity centering on the people of Israel. That's, so, so the fact that God reveals himself through deeds makes the whole history of Israel and, and culminating right with 
with the incarnation and his passion and resurrection and founding the church and sending the spirit, those are the deeds. So the words and the deeds shed light on each other. And the catechism uses this great phrase, which I, I love here, divine, sorry, divine pedagogy. In other words, God is the perfect teacher. That makes sense, right? Because he's our maker and, and he's infinitely wise. And so he teaches perfectly and part of it, so we can speak of a divine pedagogy by which he teaches us step by step. Right? And again, that's salvation history. So the fact that he teaches by calling Abraham out of um, his father's land, right? So he calls Abraham, he reveals himself to Abraham. Um, Revelation progresses right through the whole life of Israel, kind of culminating with um, Moses and Mount Sinai and the, the Mosaic covenant, but it then continues through the prophets, through the Psalms, right? The Davidic covenant, etc. And so it's continually growing up until Yeshua until the incarnation. And um, it doesn't, so it culminates. So God communicates him, himself to man gradually. That's the divine pedagogy. So we do the same, right? When we teach children, we don't teach college level courses to four year olds, right? There's a whole series of grades. And so mankind likewise went through a series of grades. And that's why we don't want to stay in the first grade. We want the whole course, but we have to receive that course in a progressive way. And then it culminates in the person and mission of the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. He's the fullness of revelation because he's a mediator of a different kind than the mediators that came before him. The me so God always, I'll explain that in a minute. God speaks through mediators, right? Abraham, Moses, um, David, the, the prophets of Israel. But those mediators um, fall short because they're a different person than the God who's revealing himself through them. So revelation reaches its culmination when God speaks not through a different person, but through himself made man, right? And so that's gonna be the culmination and there can't be anything better, right? We couldn't want any better revelation of God than a revelation that he himself makes by taking on human lips and not just human lips, a full human life and nature and reveals himself in as man. Right? So this is all marvelous. And so we should never forget that, that the very fact that he wants to speak to us and that he, so he lowers himself. St. Paul uses a phrase, he empties himself. So the divine self emptying. Another term that I sometimes use, it falls, it's not, it can be misunderstood is condescension. So condescension, when we use that in English, it has a negative connotation because it's somebody who lowers themselves, but still wants to make me know they're above me. And that's not what we mean here. So God lowers himself to put himself on our level and precisely not to take away that sense of distance. And he has to do that, right? If he wants to speak to human beings, he has to somehow put himself on our level. And that involves some kind of covenant, some kind of um, making a, a relationship, a bond of friendship and kinship. And, and so um, he does that in a way as human friends. So just as we, with above all spouses, right? But also parents with regard to their children and friends in general, when it's a deep and important friendship, we reveal ourselves gradually to our friends, right? And there's certain things that are hard for us to reveal because they're very intimate, right? And God does that with us, right? And that's what this revelation is. It's his revealing the secrets of his inner life, right? And again, that is totally gratuitous, right? That's unexpected. We can't take that for granted. I didn't, he, the fact that he adopted one people, Israel, to share his inner life, and then through Jesus has made that available to the whole world. And he doesn't, so philosophers have another principle here. Everything is received according to the mode of the receiver. Right? In other words, if I'm 
if you want to give me something, it's got to be in some way that I can receive it. So if God wants to share his life with us, he's got to share it in a way that we can receive it. And what that would mean is he's got to speak to us in a human way, right? Otherwise we won't get it. And so this is what he's done from the beginning. He's spoken to us in a human way using human language, right? And that's why, so I studied scripture when I was studying theology and a big part of that is you've got to learn Hebrew and Greek and even Aramaic is helpful because God spoke using the human languages of the people that he put himself in covenant with, right? And that's above all ancient Hebrew. And, and so that's, that's really amazing, right? That God who it, in his own inner life, he doesn't use a language, right? Because he doesn't need our limited human words. He wants to speak to human beings in our mode. And that means through the language of the people that he brought himself into covenant with. And so that's, again, that's, that's amazing. Of course, it means work on our part, the work of learning biblical Hebrew and Greek. And then he speaks to us using our own history. Right? And that's above all the history. So, so much of scripture and of God's revelation is about the history of this one people, Israel, for 2,000 years, right? culminating from Abraham to, to Jesus. And all of that history pertains, right? None of it is completely irrelevant. And that's why it's um, so much of scripture is about the history of Israel. And it's not all edifying right it includes just as human history in general has sin as well as grace and then it's gradual right because we're gradual we grow and so divine revelation um, has all of these properties it uses language human language and therefore god speaks to us using human metaphors right think of jesus so many of his parables involve metaphors of you know agricultural life or fishing but above all agriculture, because that's the condition of much of mankind. Um, and then, yes, gradual. And that's why there is not just one covenant, but two. Right? Because he can't reveal everything perfectly from the beginning, but he, there has to be a very long preparation and a culmination. Right, and so that means you can get it wrong in different ways. You could get it wrong by only wanting the first part, and staying there, or you can get wrong by only wanting the second covenant, as were the the new covenant, and being ignorant of the first, right? Or thinking that the second replaces the first rather than fulfilling it, right? And so, getting the two covenants right is really important, and that's understanding the divine pedagogy. And then. Because it's human, he uses human beings, right? So God almost never speaks directly from a cloud, right? There are a couple of times, and that we see those in the Gospels, where um, there's a voice from heaven that's heard at, when Jesus is baptized, right? The voice from heaven of the Father, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And at the transfiguration, again, right? this is my beloved Son, um, hear him. But normally... God doesn't speak directly from the clouds, right? Because that wouldn't be in a human way. And so he speaks to us, we could say in two kinds of ways, publicly and privately or personally. So personal way is in prayer. And we'll talk about that in the catechism has a magnificent fourth section on prayer. So he speaks to all of us individually in our own hearts. But he also wants to speak to us publicly, right? Because Let's suppose he only spoke to us in a personal, individual way. We'd all have our own private religion, as it were, and religion wouldn't unite us, but man is a social creature, right? We're not islands, but we're, we're social. And so it makes sense that God speaks to us in a social way. And that means using mediators who are the prophets, right? The prophets of Israel, culminating in the great prophet with a capital P, Jesus, and in that way, he can reveal himself publicly. That is one revelation that reaches many through the mediator, right? So God 
loves using a media. So he loves to use a mediator. We can say for maybe, probably lots of reasons, but two fundamental reasons so that it's social and universal. In other words, that it binds us together. We're all receiving the same revelation, not different revelations, right? We're all receiving revelation from Moses and then from Jesus and all the prophets who bind them from Abraham, et cetera, and the prophets culminating in Jesus. So it's one revelation, not for everyone. So there can be one church, right? For all Catholic means universal. Um, and then the second reason is because he loves to make use of creatures, right? And that gives us a dignity. In other words, he doesn't, God is not a micromanager, even though obviously he's omnipotent, right? He has a perfect providence that takes care of everything. It's true. But his perfect providence loves to make use of us. And the fact that he chooses mediators makes room for our contribution. And that would be, first of all, well, Adam and Eve at the very beginning, receiving the original covenant. And so we'll talk about that in a later session um, in Eden. But then um, afterwards, calling Abraham, right? And speaking through Abraham gives incredible dignity to Abraham and Abraham's faith and faithfulness. And Sarah, right? And her believing, even though she laughed first, et cetera. And her, so God's, Revelation makes use of human beings, and that's magnificent because that gives us each one of us a role to play. Not the and it's not the same role, right? In other words, everyone has a different role in this project. So to Abraham, it was to be the our father in faith, right? The um, the one that God called out um, to come to know Him in a new way and enter into a new covenant with Him, and then through Him, His family, right? The people Israel, but um. And then in that time, he called various prophets to increase that revelation, to add to it, to give more words to it. But the prophets, again, they were cooperating with God. He was speaking through them, but they had to use their own uh, personalities. And we see that, right? Every prophet has a very individual personality that comes out in his um, the prophetic book and the prophetic words and deeds. And but it wasn't just the prophets, all of Israel had a task, right? And that was to be, by being faithful to the covenant, to pass on the covenant from generation to generation, door by door in Hebrew, right? That involved that whole, so the whole people is involved in transmitting God's revelation. And that continues today, again, both in Israel and in the church. The whole, every member, that's the dignity of being baptized means that, by being baptized and confirmed, we become co-responsible for the building up of the church and the transmitting of revelation from generation to generation, right? So, all right, we're not getting new, so I'll explain that. So by using mediators, and that would be the prophets and all of Israel and, and the apostles. So Jesus, above all, Jesus, God made man, and he chose his 12 apostles from Israel, right, to be the foundation of his church and so he gives them all a prophetic role and then we have the a continuing role of passing it on to the next generation and to be a, a witness wherever we are right so everyone's called to be a witness and so that's again god makes use of us and that's beautiful right he wants our cooperation yeah from the very beginning so this is a Simply, so the catechism says, even when he disobeyed you and lost your friendships, this is a quoting from the fourth Eucharistic prayer from the mass. Even when he disobeyed you, Adam, and lost your friendship, you did not abandon him to the power of death. Again and again, you offered a covenant to man. Right? So we can think of it, the original covenant in Eden and then the covenant made with Abraham, right? And then being and gradually built up so, and renewed the Mosaic covenant, covenant renewed through Joshua and David, etc. And then the new and definitive covenant um, made by Jesus in his passion and resurrection. So salvation history, the history of the covenants that God has made. So in, we can use plural or also singular because in some sense, it's one development 
leading to the the new um, and eternal covenant that Jesus, but it doesn't cancel the previous covenants, right? They're not revoked. Anyway, we'll talk more about that later on. So again, part of the marvel, God chooses one human being out of the whole world, Abraham, right? To, to make that covenant. And that's a sign of how that he cares for everyone, right? In our individuality. So he calls one and gives him this task and this, right? To be a father of a multitude of nations. And then, so he gives to Abraham basically a series of blessings, right? And so first this, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, right? The land of Israel. And I will make you a great nation and bless you and make your name great. So you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. And him who curses you, I'll curse. And it culminates with this. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All right, what does that refer to? So the, at the beginning, it's the people Israel. I will make of you a great nation, right? That great nation is Israel. But here in you, all the families of the earth, that is, you could also translate this, all the nations, the goyim, shall be blessed. And that's in the Messiah, Jesus, right? From, descended from Abraham. Right, so that's kind of the, the plan there. And so he's using using human beings and the history of the people of Abraham. So they're the trustees. This is beautiful. So the catechism number 60 says the people descended from Abraham would be the trustees of the promise made to the patriarchs. And that would be the whole people and all the members of that people, right? And they continue. So the Second Vatican Council um, has taught that the, the covenant has never been revoked. Right? So the covenant that God made with Abraham, God's faithful, right? He's never unfaithful. We can be unfaithful, but God is faithful to that covenant and it's still, um, it hasn't been revoked and therefore still exists. And therefore there's still a mission. And that is to be this, the trustees of the promise made to the patriarchs, right? And that promise is a bubble about the Messiah, but it's also to be a witness of God's covenant. So the chosen people called to prepare for that day when God would gather all his children into the unity of the church, right? And that would be all families of the earth and being blessed. So Israel would be the root onto which the Gentiles would be grafted once they came to believe, right? So we're in the church through baptism, we're grafted into Israel, right? But a new messianically renewed Israel. Right, which we call the church. But so often we forget that, right? We tend to think of the church as this other thing. But no, it's messianic Israel renewed with a renewed messianic covenant that is the new covenant. The patriarchs, prophets, and certain other Old Testament figures have always been and always will be honored as saints. Now, that's surprising to many people. So we could say Saint Abraham, Saint Moses, Saint David, and they actually have feast days, but we don't ever hear about that from the pulpit, unfortunately. And um, so we, this is a treasure that could be much better known. And I think it would serve a great purpose to show the continuity of God's plan and the fact that, yes, in the Old Testament, sure, the Old Testament figures have their flaws as we do, right? But that doesn't stop them from, from being saints and models and through their fidelity, in their humanness. Yeah, so the, on the Association of Hebrew Catholics website, the your calendar that you put up there, David, no, there are, are some of the feast days of, um, of the saints of Israel, patriarchs. And so then the chasm goes on. To the patriarchs, God formed Israel as his people, by freeing them from slavery, right? So there's the great Exodus narrative. He established with them the covenant of Mount Sinai and through Moses gave them his law, the Torah, so that they would recognize him and serve him as the one living and true God, the provident father and just judge so that they would look for the promised savior. So again, notice how the catechism speaks of the Torah in a very positive way, right? Not as this negative thing that simply shows us um, that we're sinners, but no, it's to reveal God 
to recognize him and serve him as the one living and true God. And because it contains um, the, the promise of the Messiah. So Israel as a whole, Catechism 63, is the priestly people of God. Right? Again, so that too is, the church is likewise a priestly people. And say, that's in the first letter of Peter, chapter two. He quote, he, so we, at, at Mount Sinai, when Moses seals the covenant between Israel and God, right? And so God speaks to Moses and he um, says to the people of Israel that you are a kingdom of priests. So even though Israel has a priestly tribe, right? Levi and the family of Aaron in the tribe of Levi are the only proper ministerial priests. All of Israel is a priestly people, right? And it's a priestly kingdom. And priesthood involves giving sacrifice to God and mediating. So priesthood is to be a mediator offering sacrifice and oblations and winning God's blessing and teaching, right? So ascending sacrifice and descending blessing and teaching. And so, yes, there's was um, the family of Aaron to be priests in the ministerial sense, but all of Israel had this priestly role as a priestly people. And St. Peter quotes Exodus 19, it's Exodus 19, verse six, that speaks of all of Israel as a priestly people, um, a royal kingdom, a kingdom of priests. And uh, Peter quotes that, applying it to the whole church as well. And we speak of the royal or common priesthood of all the baptized faithful. And so again, Israel is a kind of the model of that. So Israel is the priestly people of God called by the name of the Lord. And again, so beautiful that God wants to um, adopt a people as his own, am segula, a people segregated for himself, right? And set apart for that relationship, like in marriage. The first to hear the word of God, the people of the elder brethren, right? Our elder brother, brothers in the faith of Abraham. Right, so again, beautiful how the catechism shows Israel in this positive way, which hadn't always been realized in catechesis, understatement. God forms his people Israel. And uh, we got to end in one minute. Um, anybody, um, anyway, so it's beautiful how the catechism continues to speak about all the patriarchs and the, um, as well as um, the patriarchs, the, um, the women of Israel, the great women, and usually great mothers, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Miriam, Deborah, Hannah, Judith, Esther, and the purest among them, Mary. Right? And so Mary has this whole kind of lineage um, of types of Mary, and she would be the, the ultimate daughter of Zion or daughter of Jerusalem. I right, will just leave it here. Any questions before we end? Let me. So next time we'll finish on Revelation and we'll start with our response to Revelation, which is faith. And then so we'll go through the, so I'm skipping a little bit in the catechism to number 142, I think it is, where it starts speaking about faith as our response to God. Will there be a recording available of the class? Hopefully. Good. <laughs> I missed yes, last yes, week. Yes, yes uh, Donna, there will be. Uh, I was supposed to put up the last week and I was involved in a number of projects and I couldn't get it up there, but we will have last week's and this week's up this coming week. Excellent. And we also have the whole regimen, the whole table of contents that Larry has provided. So you'll see what's coming as well. Okay. Sorry, I didn't provide that in advance. That's okay. Uh, yes. I'll make the same excuse as David. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they should all be recorded. So that's why at the beginning we had to accept uh, that this was being recorded. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you so much. So let me end with a wait, prayer. Wait. If anyone wants to stay on, you can yeah. stay on for a little bit. Hold on one second. Okay. Uh, August 11th, um, where it's a little early, but just to get it on your calendar, we'll have the uh, Javier on St. Louis uh, at six o'clock via Zoom. You'll find the uh, link for it up on our website. What was the date again, David? Uh, August 11th. It's the okay. second Friday of every month. Okay. We have it. Ken and Flora Wilska lead it. We start off with the Shabbat prayers. Uh, we do Vespers. We read the Sunday mass readings. Someone leads uh, the conversation. I think Andrew's going to do it. Aren't you, oh, Andrew? Great. Next one. And uh, 
and then we do the final prayers. And uh, so it's a nice evening. It's about an hour and a half. And the link is on our website. And if you haven't linked, if you haven't signed up for the association on the front page, there's also a link so you can affiliate with us and get our newsletter. And uh, there you go. Okay. Henny, you have a question. I do. Um, somebody asked earlier about the polygamy, and I wanted to ask a question regards to that. So um, I was, I was, um, at a Protestant church one time, and this uh, the pastor there said that he went on a mission trip where uh, they evangelized this group, and I I don't remember where it was. Uh, I want to say it was like in some Asian country, and uh, anyway, but um, he the the guy that he evangelized said, you know, you cannot tell me to divorce my wives, you know, because oh, wow. he he was in a polygamous. Yeah. colony and and he said you can't tell me to divorce my wives because if i divorce them then they're going to be treated as property right. who would provide for them right yeah. who would provide for them and you know that was a question that i wanted to ask uh what are your thoughts on that i mean it, you said it goes against the natural order and right I believe it does but in that type of situation right so i suppose he would still have to provide for them but he right. would only be properly married to one the first okay right? The first valid one, in which case he would have to be faithful to, to the one that he's actually validly married to. But anyway, yeah, so this is pastoral missionary work is very difficult, right? Because of things like this. Um, so I just thought yeah. that was interesting. Yeah, thank you for answering my question. Mm -hmm. so, so let's end with a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We give you thanks, almighty God, for revealing yourself to human beings by choosing Abraham and revealing yourself through Israel and above all, by taking on flesh and revealing your, yourself through yourself made man, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, see you next next week. So next week on faith, our response to God. Mm -hmm. if, any, if anyone has any more questions, I can stay on for a little. I wanna make sure you have my email address. I'm thinking somehow I'm not seeing your email. Perhaps I need to look in a spam folder with Gmail, which uh, is not on Outlook at the present moment, but maybe on the, gmail um server itself the, um, for this meeting or for yes for this meeting um so uh if it wasn't for my phone that popped up the reminder when i got back in the door i would have missed it again but um donna can you get to our website hebrew give catholic. me your web, give me your website please hebrewcatholic.net okay yes I wasn't and, sure that was the same one. Okay. Yeah, and, and uh, there's a button on the front page. You can yes. just click that. Okay. Uh, you can also write to us at okay. ahc at hebrewcatholic.org. Okay. Dot org. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The okay. organization is the email. Net is the web. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, William, you said you were a teacher of Spanish. If there's anybody else here who knows Spanish, I'd love to hear from you if you'd be willing to take on a project to translate a Spanish book into English. If you think, if you you don't have to answer me now, but you can write to me at uh, ahc at hebrewcatholic.org. Um, it's a book by Paul Drach, who was a entered the Catholic Church in 17, I think it was 91. And his, he wrote a book called The Harmony Between the Church and the Synagogue. Fantastic book, but it's never been available other than in the language in which it was written in France, French. And if I got a, a note uh, recently saying that he, a fellow had just translated it into Spanish. So now I'd like to find a way to translate it into English. <laughs> so I need someone who knows Spanish. And if you think Very you can help. Uh, be fresh. 
Well, I don't I, have to, I don't know even where you would get the French copy. Oh, okay. Uh, da uh, David? Spanish copy is up on Amazon. Yes. Okay. My husband speaks French fluently. So if you change your mind, you decide you maybe want it in French, let me know. Who is and, the one talking? I don't see the picture. Hannah Fontelis. Oh, Hannah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if it's a, I can, I can check. Uh, let me see, Hannah. Yeah, maybe next week we can uh, talk about it. Okay. 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 I think you have my email address, David. Yeah, so you yeah can, I do. Yeah. Okay. So your husband deals in French. He speaks in French. He yeah. speaks fluent, fluent French. Okay. Well, maybe we can do it from French or Spanish okay. or whatever. All right. <laughs> I will be in touch. About how many pages is the book? Um, I think the one in Spanish is almost 600 pages. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, <laughs> That's quite a project. That would be yeah. going from Spanish and the retail to... price in the, uh, on Amazon is... I'm uh, not going to volunteer. $78. So <laughs> it's an expensive book. But maybe we could do it through a PDF or something. We'll see. You know, make it inexpensive for people. So, okay. Are we done? Right. Yes. Good to see you. Uh -huh. See you next Thank week. Thank you so much, Dr. Feingold. Thank you mm -hmm. all, David. A pleasure, mm -hmm. everyone. Thank you so much. What a blessing to have this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. God bless. Yeah, spread the word. Yes. I shall. Please. And my wife might be with me next time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all so much. Okay. A much better half. Okay. God bless you. Thank you. Thank uh -huh. you. Shalom Hamashiach. Shalom. Shalom Hamashiach.